Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the privilege of being together, of studying your word, of hearing from your son. Father, we thank you that he is the master of life. And we know that we don't live up to the life that he lived, but we know that because of his life, we can have everlasting life. We thank you for that precious and amazing gift. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, right now, both in worship and in ABC, we are in this series. It is called Love Is. And the basic premise of the series is this. In our world, in our day, and in our age, there are a lot of misperceptions and a lot of misconceptions about what love is. And so in this series, we're just trying to clear away some of the cobwebs that surround what love is and rediscover a biblical vision and picture of love. And uh, to do this, we are spending some time in probably what is the most famous description of what love is, not only in the Bible, but of all of ancient literature. Uh, These are words from the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, uh, where Paul talks to us about what love is. He says in 1 Corinthians 13, beginning at verse 4, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil. It rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul gives us really kind of a bit of a laundry list of all the different things that love is. And so in this series, we're just using this list as a basis for what we're talking about in this series. We're going through this list bit by bit, piece by piece, and trying to do a deep dive into all the different things Paul says love is. And uh, today, as we continue our series, we're going to be talking about how love is not rude. In the NIV, Paul puts it this way, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 5, love does not destroy honor others. Now, on the one hand, when you think about rudeness, this is kind of an interesting characteristic of love. Because really, who in here really takes pride in being rude? Anybody really enjoy being rude? Anybody really enjoy telling people off? Most of us like to think of ourselves as polite people. Uh, We like to think of ourselves as polite people until we get to that really incompetent cashier at the checkout. And we are in a hurry, and we can't get to uh, seem to get out of that checkout line as fast as we would like to. They can't seem to get any of the barcodes to scan. And what happens? We begin to lose our cool. We begin to sigh and whisper all sorts of things under our breath really loudly that we secretly hope the cashier is going to hear so that they will hurry it along. Uh, We go from being polite to being rude. Or how about when you wind up on the phone with customer service from some organization and you are put on hold for a good 20 or 30 minutes and you finally get a hold of the customer service agent and uh, you ask them your question and then you're told that that is not in their department. And so they transfer you to another customer service agent, but before you get to that customer service agent, you got to be on hold with them for another 20 or 30 minutes. Anybody ever had that experience? Uh, Anybody ever really feel like giving them a piece of your mind? Anybody ever broken and given them a piece of your mind? It's funny how easy it is to go from being really polite to being rude. Uh, About a year ago now, one of the things that we decided to do in our household was cut the cable cord. We had had cable TV for years, but the prices kept going up and up, and we kept getting less and less. And so we decided that uh, we were going to switch over to streaming TV, which, by the way, we really like. But here's what I didn't like. I didn't like having to try to make the switch. I spent literally hours on the phone with customer service at my cable company. First thing I had to do was cancel my cable. I discovered something when I tried to cancel my cable. The cable company doesn't like it when you try to cancel your cable. And so they try to make it as difficult for you as possible. And so I had to go from this customer service agent to that customer service agent. But then it got even trickier uh, because I wanted to cancel my cable, but I wanted to keep my internet that I had from them. Now, when you cancel one thing and you try to keep another thing, you know what they do on the price of that other thing? They drive it way up. And so I went from customer service agent to customer service agent trying to get a deal on internet. After about, I kid you not, about five hours on the phone through various phone calls, I'm proud to say I got the deal that I wanted. I got the deal I gave to new customers for internet, but Uh, Was I just a little tempted, maybe, to become just a little bit rude over the course of those conversations? No, of course not. I always keep my cool. Okay, maybe I was just a little tempted to become just a little bit rude. You know, the fact of the matter is this. None of us like to think of ourselves as rude until we are in a situation where we are really frustrated and we think that we have a right to be rude. 
Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 5, uh, love is not rude. A little bit of Greek here for you. The Greek word for rude is the word askemineo, made up of two different parts. Skemineo, we get our English word schema from this. Uh, the idea is there's something that is a plan, there's something that is organized, there's something that has a certain shape, but then when you stick an A in front of it, it turns it into its opposite, kind of like an atheist is somebody who's not a theist, somebody who believes in God, uh, somebody who doesn't believe in God is an atheist. Askemineo means that you don't have a schema don't have shape. Uh, kind of the way that we would put this colloquially in our day and age is there are some people who can get bent out of shape. That's what askemineo is. Uh, Paul says love does not get bent out of shape. And so today we're going to be asking how can we root out the askemineo in our lives? How can we ratchet down the rudeness in our attitudes? How can we go from being bent out of shape to being put back into shape. Now, to get at this, we're going to be taking a look at some very famous words from Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. And if you got a Bible, you can turn there now. We're going to start at verse 21. Uh, Matthew 5, beginning at verse 21, uh, Jesus is going to talk to us about some of the dangers that are associated with rudeness. And so Matthew 5, verse 21, Jesus is preaching here. And he says, you've heard that it was said to people long ago, you shall not murder. And anybody who murders is going to be subject to judgment. Uh, I want to pause right there. Jesus opens by uh, citing one of the Ten Commandments. He says, you've heard that it was said to people long ago, you shall not murder. Now, we're talking about rudeness, and right out of the gate, I should say this. Um, this is kind of a strange text to use to talk about rudeness, because the fact of the matter is this. There's a big difference between being impolite and committing a capital crime. Would you agree? Uh, there's a big difference between uh, committing a verbal offense and committing physical assault. It's kind of like the old children's rhyme, right? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but what? Words can never hurt me. Yeah. And so there's a big difference between some ill-chosen words and using a weapon and getting some prison time. And yet what Jesus is going to do here in Matthew chapter 5 when he starts by talking about murder is he's going to connect murder to our words. He's going to connect a capital crime to somebody who's just being rude. In fact, one of the major problems that I would say that we have in our society and in our culture is that in a lot of ways we don't really take our words seriously enough. Our society is a society that has made talk very, very cheap. We just say anything we feel like sometimes. I was reading a fascinating article by a guy named Frederick Lawrence. Here he is. He's a professor at the Law Yale School, and he talks about public discourse in our society, and he was talking about some of the things that we need to do to recover a higher level of public discourse. And he says there are really three things that are important to having good discourse. First, we need to be discerning of the information that we receive. In other words, just because you see it on TV or just because you read it on the internet, or just because your second cousin twice removed told you this, doesn't necessarily make it true. And so one of the things we need to do is we need to figure out what is true and what is false, what is right, what is wrong, what is helpful, what is unhelpful, and not just share it without doing a little bit of fact-checking of it, because when we share false information, that doesn't elevate a level of discourse, it actually drives want to see some dangerous discourse in our society, if you want to see some discourse that can sometimes be factually untrue, just take a scroll through social media one day and you will see some things that are awesome and amazing and insightful and wonderful. And you will see some other things where you kind of scratch your head and go, I'm not sure that's real. And you would probably be right. We need to be discerning of the information that we receive, Frederick Lawrence says. Second thing we have to do is we need to be discerning of the arguments that we make. Uh, the idea here is this. Any argument that you make, it always has some strengths and it always has some weaknesses. And one of the best things you can do with your own arguments is not only argue for their strengths, but also recognize and realize their weaknesses. Because when you can understand the weaknesses of your own arguments, and when you can think about those, and when you can ponder those, and when you can study those, and when you can admit those, you know what that makes your argument? It doesn't make it weaker, it actually makes it stronger. Because now you know the shortfalls of what you're saying 
and you've thought about the shortfalls of what you're saying, and you can deal with the shortfalls of what you're saying, and you're being honest about them, which tends to give you more credibility rather than less credibility. And so you want to be discerning of information that you receive. You want to be discerning of arguments that you make. And then finally, you want to engage in reasoned debate with other people. Uh, the idea here is the proverbial saying that iron sharpens iron. Eventually, you want to get out of an echo chamber. Don't just listen to people who agree with you. Debate with people who disagree with you because when you get into those debates, that again can make your arguments stronger. It also teaches you how to have a civil conversation with maybe some people who you vociferously disagree with. That's one of the things we've got to learn how to do. We've got to learn how to make careful arguments, but also gracious arguments. We've got to learn how not just to have combative conversation, but generative dialogue where we solve problems and learn new things. And really, that's what Jesus is pressing toward in Matthew chapter 5. When he says, you've heard that it was said to people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment, because Jesus follows it up in the very next verse, verse 22, by saying that I tell you that anybody who is angry with a brother, in other words, anybody who is rude with a brother or a sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anybody who says to a brother or a sister, racha, is answerable to the court. And anybody who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. I want you to notice what Jesus does here. In verse 21, Jesus talks about homicide. In the very next verse, verse 22, Jesus moves very quickly to rudeness, to the words that we say, to the anger that we feel. Jesus says, even if you're angry with your brother or your sister, you can be subject to judgment. Here's the best way to kind of think about this, okay? Anger, in a lot of ways, is kind of like an acorn. Uh, my, my little four-year-old girl, Hope, she loves acorns. And part of the reason she loves acorns is because when I tell her, you know, if you plant that acorn in the ground and you fertilize it just right and you'll water it and it gets plenty of sunshine, what does that little acorn grow into? It grows into a giant tree. And she's always kind of amazed at that. How can something so small grow into something that is so big? How can something so simple grow into something that is so majestic? The argument that Jesus is making here in Matthew 5, 21 and 22 is that anger is kind of like an acorn. Anger may look really small. Anger may look really simple. But if you plant anger in the ground, and if you start to water it, and if you start to fertilize it with malicious intents and bad thoughts and long-standing grudges, you know what that anger is going to do? It's going to sprout, and it's going to grow, and it may grow into something massive. It may grow into something as dangerous and as devastating as murder. And so, Jesus says, be careful with your anger. If you are angry with your brother or your sister, Jesus says, you're going to be subject to judgment. Jesus says that anger can lead to deep judgment, and here's the reason why. Let's say that somebody does something to you that makes you justifiably angry at them because they've wronged you, they've grieved you, they've done something awful to you. And, and so in your anger, you begin to judge them and you begin to hate them and you begin to tell them all the things that they have been wrong. You become very judgmental of them because of what they've done to you. That works fine until you do something to them that angers them justifiably at you and they return the favor. They get angry with you. And they become judgmental of you. And they become hateful and spiteful toward you. And now all of a sudden you are judging them and they are judging you. And all you have all the way around is a bunch of judgment and anger and hatred and spite. Uh, one of the things that we do in our house at the end of the day is we like to go for walks, kind of a nice way to unwind. We go for a walk down Hebner Road, not far from here because we don't live too far from here. And uh, so we have the stroller uh, where I will usually push it. Melody will walk the dog. And then uh, we have the stroller where one kid sits in the top and one kid sits in the bottom. And uh, the kids are always fighting over which kid gets to sit in the top of the stroller, the top seat in the stroller, because if you sit in the top seat in the stroller, you know what you can do to the kid in the bottom seat of the stroller? You can take your feet and do this. Kick, 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 kick. And so Hope always wants to sit in the top seat of the stroller so she can kick Hayden in the bottom seat of the stroller. But Hayden now is one and a half, and he's no dummy. He will now try to get to the stroller before Hope does, and he wants to sit in the top seat of the stroller. You know why? So that he can kick 
the bottom seat of the stroller. Back and forth it goes. And it's so funny because whoever is in the top seat of the stroller kicking the kid in the bottom seat of the stroller, the kid in the bottom seat of the stroller, you know what they will do? They will say, stop it. Hayden will say to Hope, stop it. But then when the seats are reversed and Hayden's in the top seat of the stroller and Hope's in the bottom seat, Hope is saying to Hayden, stop it. Both of our kids, they know how to judge each other. They know when the other one is doing wrong. And they are happy to speak up about how the other one is doing wrong. But does it really solve anything? No. Does it change their behavior? No. Because as soon as the shoe is on the other foot, they're using that shoe to kick their brother or their sister. Here's the problem. With every single time somebody does something to anger you, you become judgmental of them. That only means that eventually that person who has angered you will become judgmental of you because you will eventually do something to justifiably anger them. Paul puts it like this in Romans 2 beginning at verse 1. He says, you don't have any excuse. You who pass judgment on somebody else. For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the exact same thing. You who teach others. Don't you know how to teach yourself? You who preach against stealing. Do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery. Do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols. Do you rob temples? You who boast in the law. Do you dishonor God by breaking the law? The sins we judge others for often become the very sins that we are judged for. Because the sins that we get angry at others for are the same sins that we commit our selves. And so if you're angry at somebody else's sin, Jesus says be very, very careful because eventually somebody else is going to be angry at you for that same sin. That is the danger of anger. Now, here's part of what I find so fascinating about this take on anger, that anger really can be this dangerous, that anger really can sprout and grow into something as serious as murder. Jesus taught this. This is true. But Jesus was not the only one who taught this. Even a lot of the Jews in the first century knew that there were a lot of dangers associated with becoming angry. I want to show you a quote from something called the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls were written down by a group of Jewish people who lived in caves outside of the city known as the Essenes. And the Essenes, in their manual of living together, they talk about some of the dangers of anger. And this is what they say. They say, if anybody speaks angrily, he is to be punished by reduced rations for one year and separated from the pure meals of the general membership, eating by himself. Here's how seriously the Essenes took anger in their little community. If you got angry, if you could not keep your temper in check, if you became rude and arrogant and judgmental, you would be ostracized from the community for a whole year. You would have to eat by yourself for a whole year because the Essenes said, this is how dangerous anger can be. Jesus says in the second half of verse 22 of Matthew 5, if you say to your brother or sister, Raha, you're answerable to the, to the court. If you say to your brother or sister, you're fool, you're going to be in danger of the fire of hell. What Jesus does is he picks up on a couple of rude insults that were very common in his day. The first is Raha. Uh, Raha is an Aramaic word. It means empty head. And then the second is the word fool. Uh, in Greek, this is the word moros. We get an English word from this, moron. And so basically, Jesus is using two different insults that essentially mean the same thing. To call someone raha is to call them stupid. To call someone a fool or a moron, again, is to call them stupid. Uh, But here's what I really want you to notice. I want you to notice what can happen when you're rude in these ways. If you call someone raha, Jesus says, you are answerable to the court. Now, the court that Jesus has in mind here, in fact, the uh, Greek word for this court is the word Sanhedrin. And Sanhedrin, that was kind of the supreme court of ancient Israel. And so Jesus says, let's say that you utter a rude insult to someone. That is such a serious offense. It is such a serious crime that we're going to like move you past all the appellate courts and you're going to go straight to the supreme court. And you're going to have to explain yourself to the supreme court of ancient Israel because this is how serious getting angry and becoming rude can be. 
Or let's say you call someone a moron, a moros, a fool. This is how dangerous that is. Not only is there like secular judgment or earthly judgment with a court like the Sanhedrin, uh, you can actually be in danger, Jesus says, of the fires of hell. And so there's eternity that is actually placed in danger by rudeness. Greek word for this uh, phrase, hell, is the word Gehenna. Uh, Gehenna in the ancient world was actually a place where a lot of the ancient Israelites, when they fell into idolatry, they would sacrifice their children in the fire to these idols. And what happened in ancient Israel was that there was this king, his name was Josiah, and he saw that and he knew that it was wrong. And so he took that place, Gehenna, where they would sacrifice their children to idols, and he turned it into the town dump. And the town dump in Jerusalem came complete with burning trash fires because that's how they would get rid of their fires. Hence, or that's how they would get rid of their trash. Hence the phrase, the fire of hell. Uh, here's kind of the idea. Jesus is saying, if you're rude, it's kind of like you're throwing all your credibility. It's kind of like you're throwing all your personality right into the fires of a trash dump. You're dangering your soul. Because Gehenna is not only a temporal place, Gehenna theologically is an eternal place. And so the big idea is this, just by calling somebody some nasty names, you can be in danger of human and divine judgments. Here's the big idea. Being rude is not just a little sin. Being rude, according to Jesus, is really serious business. You know, I was thinking about this. One of the things that I find fascinating about this series that we've been working through and Paul and what he says, what love is in 1 Corinthians 13 is that on the surface, Paul's list doesn't look like anything particularly profound or significant. Paul says, love is patient. We all kind of shake our heads and go, yeah, I know. Or love is kind. Oh, yeah, of course love is kind. Or love does not envy. Well, yeah, that makes sense. Or love is not rude. Well, of course it's not rude. But here's the funny thing. If you dig just below the surface, Paul's list in 1 Corinthians 13, you find out that these little things, these things where everybody just kind of goes, yeah, I guess that's true, these little things are actually really big deals. We were talking about how love is patient during our first week together. Uh, we took a look at a story from the life and the times of the first king of Israel, a guy named Saul. And because of Saul's lack of patience, you know what happened to Saul? He lost the whole kingdom of Israel. It was ripped out of his family. Not being patient was a really big deal. Last weekend, we talked about how love does not envy. And we reflected on how envy was one of the driving forces, one of the precipitating causes behind the cross itself. It was the religious leaders who became very envious of Jesus because Jesus was smarter than them, a better preacher than them, more popular than them, and they eventually became so envious, they became so jealous that they basically put together a kangaroo court to convict Jesus to death. Their envy resulted in the unjust death of a man. Envy doesn't look like a big deal, but it becomes a huge deal. This weekend, we talk about how love is not rude, and our world is full of rudeness. Silly insults like raha and you fool. And Jesus says this stuff is so serious, it could get you all the way to the Supreme Court of ancient Israel. Jesus says this stuff is so serious that it puts you in danger of the fires of hell. This list looks so simple, and yet this list is so weighty. You know, this teaches us something very profound about love just in general. All the things that love is, and all the things that love does, when you take all these things together, when you live these things out, the impact of love can be huge. But when you begin to tear things off this list, when things on this list begin to fall apart, the effects can be devastating. I don't know how many people I've talked to over the course of my ministry who've had some relationship. A lot of times it's their marriage. It just falls apart. And one of the spouses winds up in my office distraught because they honestly don't know what happened. And they'll say things like, I wasn't perfect, but it wasn't like I did really bad. And I'll dig a little bit deeper and I'll find out that they weren't patient with their spouse for many, many years. Or they were very envious of their spouse because of something that they had done. Maybe a job they had where they made more money. 
or they were just generally rude to their spouse. They'd make fun of them or belittle them or they wouldn't treat them with respect. And after years and years and years, the spouse finally has enough and they say it's over. And now aside from the miracle that could come, maybe, the marriage has fallen apart. So often we look at these things on Paul's list as little things. We should look at these things on Paul's list as big deals because they are. Just study each of the things on this list and figure out what happens when you don't do the things on this list and you will see the things on Paul's list of what love is really, really matter. And so what Jesus is going to do in Matthew 5 as he continues is he's going to talk to us about what happens when we refuse to be not rude. Fall prey into rudeness, into words like raka, and into words like moros, into words that are meant to tear people down rather than to build people up. Jesus wants us, because we all fall prey to rudeness, Jesus wants us to be able to recover from rudeness. And so here's what Jesus says. Matthew 5, 23 and 24, he says, Therefore, if you've fallen prey to rudeness, if you've done something that angers somebody else, and if you're offering your gift at the altar, and you there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to your brother or your sister, and then come and offer your gift. Jesus says, you know what, if you've been rude to somebody else, if you've offended somebody else, if somebody else is angry at you for some reason, any reason at all, you should be willing to get up out of the middle of a worship service and go and be reconciled to that person. Now, Jesus says, if you've done something to anger somebody else, you should go to them, try to be reconciled to them. Now, I have talked to some people over the years who have said to me, yeah, that's fine. If I do something to somebody else, I will go and I will apologize and I will make it right and I will say I'm sorry. But if somebody else does something to me, I'm not going to them. They should come to me. Because now I'm not the one who's done something wrong. They're the one who's done something wrong. And if they want to make this relationship right, they need to come to me and they need to talk to me and they need to be reconciled to me. If you have ever said this or thought this or felt this, I would just point you to what Jesus says in Matthew 18, verse 15, where he says, if your brother or your sister sins against you, in other words, if somebody does something rude to you, if somebody does something mean to you, you go and you point out their fault just between the two of you. You go and try to be reconciled to them just between the two of you. And so, in Matthew 5, verse 23, Jesus says, if you do something rude, you go and you try to make amends. In Matthew 18, Jesus says, if somebody else does something rude, you go and try to make amends. Because the point is not who's done something rude. The point is not who's done something wrong. The point is in the middle of rudeness, you'll want to get things reconciled. You'll want to get things fixed. And so if you've done something wrong, if somebody else has done something wrong, if you've been rude, if somebody else has been rude, if you're in the middle of a worship service and you're offering your gift at the altar and you remember that your brother or your sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. Now, here's the next thing I want you to notice about what Jesus says. I want you to notice the definite article in front of this word, altar. Jesus said if you're at the altar and you're making a gift at the altar and you realize that somebody has something against you, leave your gift at the altar. Go and be reconciled to your brother or sister. Then come back to the altar. Here's the reason the definite article is so important. It cues us into the fact that Jesus doesn't just have in mind any old altar. Jesus actually has in mind a very specific altar. There was only one altar that was the altar in ancient Israel. There was only one altar that could be referred to as the place in the ancient world in ancient Jerusalem. And that was the altar at the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, first century Jewish historian, his name is Josephus, he talks about the split the temple and the splendor of the altar at the temple in ancient Jerusalem. This is what Josephus says about the temple and about the altar in the temple. He says, the outward face of the temple was likely to surprise either men's minds or their eyes, for it was covered all over with plates of gold of great weight. 
And at the first rising of the sun, it reflected back a very fiery splendor and made those who forced themselves to look upon it to turn their eyes away, just as they would have done at the sun's own rays. And so the idea was the whole temple at sunrise or at sunset, it would glow. And then inside the temple, before the temple stood the altar. It was 15 cubits high and equal both in length and in breadth, each of which dimensions was 50 cubits. And just to give you a sense of this altar size, one cubit equals roughly 19 inches. And so 15 cubits high would be about 24 feet high. 50 cubits long would be about 80 feet wide. Can you imagine the size of that altar? That's a massive altar. That's an awe-inspiring altar. And so what would happen, most people in ancient Jerusalem and in ancient Israel, they didn't live very close to the temple. And so they would go to their local synagogue for their average worship service. But every once in a while, they would make a pilgrimage for like a high holy day. They would travel, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, even 100 miles on foot just to get to the altar at the temple in Jerusalem. And Jesus says, okay, let's say you've traveled 80 miles to the altar at the temple in Jerusalem. Let's say you haven't been there in years and years and years and years. And this is your moment to make an offering at the altar in the temple of Jerusalem. This is something you've been saving for. This is something you've been waiting for. This is the ancient version for you as a first century Jew of taking your family to Disneyland. You're at Disneyland, the altar, the temple in Jerusalem. And you're making a sacrifice. You're giving a gift. You're at a holy and divine moment and you remember that somebody has something against you. Leave the altar and go make it right. Go set things straight. Because that dispute is more important than even this time that you may have traveled miles for. Go back. Go back 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 miles. Go talk to that person. Get it right. And then come back. And finish your worship service. Being rude, getting angry. Is that serious, Jesus says. A few weeks ago, my four-year-old daughter, Hope, uh, came down with a little virus, and she had to stay home from school for a day. And uh, she slept for a good portion of the day, which I was thankful for because I was on daddy duty that day. But even after she woke up, you could tell that she was not well uh, because she was not bouncing off the wall. She just kind of wanted to lay on the couch and didn't want to do much of anything. And so I had to figure out a way to entertain her because I could have let her watch TV all day, but then mommy would have found out about that, and that would not have gone well. And so I decided that I was going to take one of her stuffed animals. She had this stuffed owl that for years she loved, and she would take naps with it. And so I took a stuffed owl out, and I just started playing a little game with her. I uh, began to make it flap its wings, and I began to make the owl talk to her, and I began to make it say, who, who, who are you? And uh, she had to say to me, I am Hope. And uh, then I made the owl tickle her for a little while, and she really enjoyed that. And it was funny because I thought not much of it. We played the game for about a half an hour, and after that, I was really, really, really done with the game. Uh, You know what happened that evening? She said, Daddy, can you play owl with me again? You know what happened the next day? She said, Daddy, can you play owl with me again? You know what happened with me the day after that? She said, Daddy, can you play owl with me again? When I was playing with the owl, I did not think it was that big of a deal. In fact, more than that, I thought it was kind of an annoying deal. But as it turns out, that thing that I didn't think was that big of a deal, to her, it was a big deal. She thought I was the funniest daddy in the world. That's kind of nice. You know, I was thinking about that experience, and here's what I've come to realize. All too often, we underestimate the effects that we have on people, either for good or for ill. And so Jesus' point here is this. Don't underestimate the effects that your words can have on people, either for good or for ill. Words like racha. Phrases like, you fool. That can do a lot more damage to somebody than you think it might. And so make sure you go and make it right. 
Jesus wraps up Matthew 5, verse 25, settle matters quickly with your adversary who's taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, Jesus says, you will not get out until you've paid the last penny. There are three things here that I want you to notice about this last little section. The first thing I want you to notice is this phrase that Jesus uses at the very beginning where he says, settle matters quickly with your adversary. The Greek word for this phrase, settle matters quickly, is the word you not eo, made up of two different parts. You is a prefix that means good, and then noeo is a uh, verb that means to think. It refers to your mind. And so here's the idea. If you have an adversary, if you have someone who's mad at you, if you have an enemy, you want to you not eo them. Uh, you want to think good thoughts about them, Jesus says. In other words, you always want to assume the best about your enemy, instead of assuming the worst about your enemy. And this is actually a very strategic way to operate, and and here's the reason why. If you assume the worst about your enemy and about your adversary, what will happen is that you will say something really bad about your enemy, or you will make an assumption that is really bad about your adversary. And if you say something that is really bad or make an assumption that is really bad, assume the worst about your adversary, your adversary may be able to cover their tracks. Even if they've done something mean to you, even if they've done something wrong to you intentionally, they can come back and they can say, well, I didn't mean it that way. You sure are being rude to me. But here's the thing, if you assume the best about your adversary, if you assume that they're doing something good, even when they really mean something bad by it, and you say that, If they do something mean and you put the best construction on it, now all of a sudden you've backed your adversary into a corner because they have two choices. They can either say, well, no, I really meant to hurt you and to be a total jerk, or they have to live up to what you've just said about them. And most people, if you assume something nice about someone, even if they meant something mean by it, they will try to from thenceforth be nice because nobody likes to admit that they are being mean. Nobody likes to admit that their intentions were not pure. And so Jesus says, think good thoughts about your adversary. Even if they do something wrong, try to spin it so that it's something good and something right, because by doing so, you're going to back them into a corner, because they're going to have to live up to your real nice words about them, even though they were trying to be real mean to you. And so you na'o, your adversary, And then Jesus says, verse 25, do it while you are still together. And here's the second thing I want you to pick up on. If somebody is rude to you, there is a window in your relationship where it may not be completely destroyed, where you are still together. And that is the best time ever to try to make things right. That is the best time ever to try to reconcile a situation. Because the longer you wait, the bigger it will become, and the more things will begin to spin out of control, and the deeper the relationship will fracture. In fact, Jesus says, if you don't do it while you're still together, and a third party gets involved, like a judge or a court, well, your adversary, he's going to hand you over to the judge, the judge is going to hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. And then Jesus says, truly I tell you, you're not going to get out until you've paid the last penny. If you don't fix this while well, it's just the two of you, things aren't going to get better, things are just going to get worse. In fact, you could wind up in prison. You're not going to be able to get out of prison, Jesus says, until you've paid the last penny. And here's the last thing I want you to pick up on. This uh, Greek word for penny is the word kadrantes. Now, in the ancient world, kadrantes represented one-sixty-fourth of what an average day laborer would make. And in the first century, an average day laborer would make nothing more than minimum wage. And so these days, if you do a little bit of math with me, minimum wage is seven twenty-five dollars an hour. If you're a day laborer and you work an eight-hour day, you know how much that is? Fifty-eight bucks. And so you divide that by one sixty-fourth, which is a cadrantes, that's 91 cents. And so here's the idea. Jesus says, for less than a dollar, if you have an adversary that you don't reconcile with, If you have an adversary and you let this whole thing spin out of control for less than a dollar, they will try to keep you in prison. For 91 stinking cents, they will try to take you down. This is what can happen, Jesus says. When rudeness 
begins to attack a relationship. Now, all I can say at this point is, yikes. If you didn't think rudeness was a big deal, if you didn't think words that people say can have profound effects, I'm not sure how Jesus can make this any clearer. Is it any wonder that Jesus' brother James can say things like James 3 verse 6, the tongue is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, it sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Jesus' brother gets what Jesus is saying in Matthew 5. The words that we use, the anger that we harbor, the rudeness that we display is dangerous business. And so, as people who follow Jesus, we are called to refrain from speaking rudely, and instead, we are called to, in our lives, speak lovingly. And so, as we wrap up today, let me just give you three ways that we can speak lovingly. Because the words that come out of our mouth matter. And so three things you can do to kind of root out a little bit of rudeness and instead speak with a little bit more love because love is not rude. And the first thing you can do is you can learn how to speak slowly. I've told you this before. The theme verse for my marriage is James 1 verse 19. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And the reason that I like this verse so much is because it has kept me from saying a lot of really stupid things and from, you know, my mouth getting in front of my brain. I want to make sure that when I speak to my wife, I'm speaking thoughtfully and respectfully and sweetly to her. I do not want to speak flippantly or arrogantly or rudely to her. And sometimes that means before I say something, i got to think about what I'm going to say before I say it. So that my mouth does not get ahead of my brain. Uh, Several years ago, Melody and I were reminiscing about our dating days because we've known each other for a very long time. In fact, we actually knew each other before we dated each other. Uh, We dated after I became a pastor. We knew each other when we were going to college together. We went to the same college in Austin together. And so we were having a conversation about those days and all the good times we had in college. And we weren't really close friends. We were just kind of acquaintances. And uh, we never dated. And so she asked me, so in college, what did you think of me? I mean, did you ever have any feelings for me? Maybe even just a little romantic spark for me? Because she's kind of hoping, oh yeah, I always knew that she was the one. And so I respond to her, well, to be honest, honey, in college, I thought nothing of you. (laughs) True story, this this really happened. Now, have you ever had one of those moments where as soon as some words left your mouth, you wish you could put them back in your mouth? Okay. It was at that point that James 1 verse 19 became the theme verse for my marriage. Because this right here is why it's so important to speak slowly. Because those words may have left my mouth a long time ago. That was years ago. But they have not left the lore of my marriage. She still likes to remind me that I told her that once upon a time. Now, in our case, we get a good laugh out of it. Because that's just me being stupid, which I tend to do a lot. But sometimes words can be really hurtful. They can be really damaging. And sometimes if you just take a moment to figure out how to say something before you say it, you can save someone from a lot of hurt. The basic principle of speaking slowly is this. A little bit of thought right now can save you a whole bunch of pain later. And so do the work of speaking slowly now so that you don't have to clean up a mess later. To speak lovingly, just take a little bit more time. Speak slowly. Second way to speak lovingly. To speak lovingly, you want to speak truthfully. Something you need to know about rudeness. You can be rude sometimes without saying much of anything at all. Here's here's the way this this works. A wife goes to her husband at the end of the day and she can tell that something is not quite right with him. And so she says to him, honey, how is your day? To which he says with his arms crossed and a big scowl on his face, fine. And she says to him, well, is everything okay? 
To which he says, yes. And she gets a little bit worried. And so she begins to push and to prod a little bit because she's concerned about her husband. And what does her husband say? It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Okay, here's the question, okay? Um, Nonverbal cues, 101. Is everything fine, yes or no? No. Um, Is he saying much? No. Is he being rude much? Yes. Because one of the simplest ways to be rude without saying much of anything is just to be passive-aggressive. To say to someone, no, you didn't do anything to hurt me when they really did something to hurt you. To say to someone, no, I'm not mad at you when clearly you're really mad at them. What you're doing when you're being passive-aggressive like that is you're lying to them, just flat out. You're not speaking truthfully to them. You're just letting something simmer under the surface. And when you let something simmer under the surface, it doesn't get better. It just gets worse. And so one of the ways to speak lovingly is to speak truthfully. If somebody has hurt you, it is good to go to them and gently and charitably, but also candidly say to them, you hurt me. And here's how. And by the way, just kind of a relationship 101 bit of guidance. If somebody comes to you and they do, Say to you, you hurt me. If somebody comes to you and they do tell to you the truth, here's what you don't want to do. You don't want to begin by defending yourself. You don't want to begin by getting angry. You don't want to just try to shut down the conversation. You know what you want to say? Two words, I'm sorry. To affirm that even if you didn't mean to, you did hurt them. And so to speak lovingly, sometimes you've got to speak truthfully. Don't play passive-aggressive games and lie. Final way to speak lovingly then is you want to speak regularly. In other words, the best way to show someone through your words that you love them is to say to them often, I love you, or to have conversations with them often about your life, about your hopes, about your fears, about your dreams. You know, one of the reasons that we always go for a family walk at the end of the day is because the two kids in front are so busy annoying each other that they don't even care about mommy and daddy. And so mommy and daddy can walk down the street and the two kids can have a conversation about our day every single day. Kind of catch up on what's going on around the office. She can catch up on what's going on around the classroom. We just kind of share our days and talk to each other about whatever's going on in life, about whatever we need to take care of. It's a good way to have a regular conversation every single day. We're having our conversation. The kids are having their conversation. They're saying, stop it. We're just kind of going along in blissful ignorance. It's really kind of nice. But that's one way to foster and grow love, just to to talk to people that you love on a regular basis. Here's the best way to know how to explain it. It's kind of like this. If you've ever been in an interviewer, uh, if you've ever been in an interview, and it doesn't matter if you're the interviewer or the interviewee, um, you know that sometimes a job interview can be kind of an awkward experience for both of the parties involved. Because you've got two people in a room, or maybe more, and a lot of times these two parties do not know each other. And so you always try to put your best foot forward because if you're the interviewer, you want to make sure that the interviewee thinks, wow, this company is a really good place to work. And if you're the interviewee, you want to make sure the interviewer is thinking to themselves, wow, this is the person that we want to hire. And so you try to pull out all the stops and you try to carry yourself really well and you try to choose your words very carefully so that you can impress the interviewer with your skills and abilities and the interviewer can impress the interviewee with their amazing corporate culture. You do this little dance where in one sense you're kind of bluffing each other almost. But then if the interview goes well and the person is hired, all of a sudden the communication between those two parties begin to change because now you're around these people all the time. Eight hours a day, five days a week, a lot of times even more than that. You're talking to these people. You're getting to know these people. You learn about these people's spouses. You learn about these people's kids. You learn about these people's lives. And your communication with them becomes a lot deeper. You begin to bluff them a lot less. Because you begin to care about them a lot more. In fact, sometimes if your corporate culture is healthy and good, You begin to love them, pray for them. If they go through a hard time, you're there for them. 
That's what regular communication does. It takes shallow talk and it turns it into deep talk. It takes polite talk and it turns it into truly loving talk. That's the kind of communication that we need. There's something about regular conversation that fosters and deepens love. Because you're saying to somebody else, you know what, you're important enough to me that I'm not only going to talk to you because I have to, I'm going to talk to you because I want to. In fact, just one more thing. I was thinking about this. When God wanted to show that he loved us, he didn't just send us a conqueror or an angel from heaven or some spirit divine being. He didn't send us a ruler like an emperor. You know what he sent us? According to John 1 verse 1, he sent us a conversation. He sent us a word. John puts it like this, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then in verse 14, John says, this word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. John here is talking about Jesus, and John calls Jesus the word because Jesus is the one who means that God has come to have a word with us. God has come to carry on a conversation with us. God has come to speak tenderly to us. To proclaim to us things like forgiveness of sins. To proclaim to us things like everlasting life. To proclaim to us things like salvation that comes from the righteousness of God's Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus is called the Word because God wants to speak to you. And the promise is this. When God comes to speak to you through Jesus Christ, rather than a word of judgment, rather than a word of condemnation, rather than a word of anger, through Jesus and through His cross, God speaks to you a word of love. Because God himself is love. And love is not rude. Love is full of compassion. Just like Christ. Speak like Him. Let's stand and pray. Heavenly Father, in a world where words are often not used wisely, we pray that we would buck that trend. We pray that we would choose our words carefully. We pray that we would use our words to glorify You. To sometimes speak hard things and difficult things, truthful things. But Father, may we not speak those things rudely. May we speak them with a heart full of compassion, just like your son at the same time that he warns us. He also shows us that he is the way, he is the truth, and he gives to us his life so that we may have everlasting life. We thank you for that and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good week. Walk with light.